Professor in Sociology and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Windsor and the Interim Head of Interdisciplinary and Critical Studies Department. But before I continue, um, let us take a moment to reflect on the land we are on and our relationship with the Indigenous peoples in order to change the way we think about our histories and our geographies and to see Canada beyond the ways that the Europeans have constructed it while forcibly occupying it. We have gathered here at the University of Windsor, which is located at the traditional territory of the Three Fives Confederacy of First Nations, uh, com comprised of the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. And those on the virtual platform should also take a moment to recognize the importance of the land on which we are each located. We acknowledge the territory to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in building positive relationships between nations and in developing a deep understanding of Indigenous peoples and their cultures. I would like to thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. In acknowledging the land and the people, we can better embrace a shared understanding of past injustices, including cultural genocide and mass graves of children, as well as the ongoing colonial practices to make possible the missing and murdered Indigenous women, so that we can find ways to create a more empowered and equitable future together. Acknowledging this land and people is only the first step to reconciliation. We also need to commit to investing our resources and taking action in our own individual and collective ways to work in solidarity with Indigenous peoples and to make a contribution towards this future. So on behalf of the university and the interdisciplinary and critical studies department, I would like to warmly welcome you all to the town hall discussion, crucial voices the importance of representation and public institutional leadership. I also want to thank President Gordon for supporting this event. Um, the panelists here we have here is represent the researchers, instructors and administrators and librarians at the University of Windsor who have an investment in seeing more diverse representation in our public institutions that will promote a dynamic, just learning, caring, and sharing community and to ensure that all segments of the population are included and given a seat at the table. Public institutions should not only be concerned with governance in a narrow sense, they should be engaging the community to bring the more voices and perspectives into the governing of the polity and to minimize oppressive practices. We are holding this town hall here to signal that the university is part of the city. I can't turn my head. Each time I turn my head. I'm <laughs> so, and we are here because we want to engage the community in a dialogue. We are also here because we aspire to be responsive to diverse needs and perspectives. We aspire to do better than we have done in the past and to grow together with the community. The university is a public institution uh, as a public institution should be working with other public institutions to improve the city and the region in which we reside. As such, we have begun by developing the interdisciplinary and critical studies department, which will house Black Studies Institute, Disability Studies, Liberal and Professional Studies, Social Justice, Women's and Gender Studies, and Work and Employment. This department is developed to foster community engaged scholarship and to produce active, curious, critical and involved students who are concerned and committed to the community and to a cosmopolitan citizenship. They will be confident in providing leadership in our public institutions and offer their perspectives, support, analysis and critiques to make the city thrive and grow. There are many things wrong with the current public leadership, but there are also many things that we can do right. The panelists here will use their expert knowledge, research and personal experiences in their various everyday roles to discuss how the university and university members can contribute to public leadership and in engaging the community and public institutions. So let me introduce you to the impressive panel that we have. 
So I'll start with Ron John. Doc, let me find my notes. Don't laugh. <laughs> Dr. Ron John Paul Dada is an award winning associate professor and graduate faculty member in the Department of Sociology and Criminology, where he specializes in social theory. He is an elected member of the Ex Executive of the Canadian Sociological Association and has recently served on the University of Windsor Senate and the Board of Canterbury College as the Anglican Bishop of Huron's appointee. Dr. Data's work on a, has been on a wide array, array of topics, has been published in major national and international scholarly venues, including UNESCO's International Social Science Journal, the Canadian Review of Sociology, and the Journal for the Theory of Social Behavior. His most recent publications discuss suicide ideation and social support in Canada, and ideology, class struggle, and social production. At present, he is writing a book on social theory, the sacred and power. I should have made you all sit according to the notes I have. <laughs> all right. Okay, so you have to pardon me in this one because there's a lot of French pronunciation that I'm not good at. So Dr. Emmanuel Richet is an Associate Professor of Political Science and the 2022-2023 Humanities and Research Group Fellow at the University of Windsor. Her research examines law and politics in Canada with a current focus on first and official language rights. She's an affiliated researcher at Centre d'Analyse Politique, Constitution et Federalisme <laughs> at the Université de Québec à Montréal, an associate member of the Centre d'études et de recherche comparative sur les constitutions, les libertés et l'État at the Université de Bordeaux. How did I do? <laughs> Dr. Richet is an elective trustee for the French Public School Board Viamont, representing the region of Essex. She is a federally appointed member of the expert panel on official language rights of the Court Challenges Program of Canada, as well as its vice president. She frequently provides com commentary on Canadian politics in local and national media. And next we have... We have Dr. Natalie Delia Deckard is a critical criminologist working from the paradigms of critical race theory. While seeking to deconstruct racialization as a social process, she interrogates the criminalizing processes through which North Americans collectively imagine the non-white other. By investigating the inherent criminality of the racialized body and the ways in which that designation is complicated by migrant identity, she speaks to the questions of identity, conflict, violence, and the construction of the racial ethnic other. Dr. Deckard is a member of the editorial board of a number of scholarly journals, including the Journal of Human Trafficking and the Sociology of Race and Ethnicity. She has published 30 peer-reviewed articles in academic venues such as Social Forces, the Canadian Review of Sociology, and Citizenship Studies. She's the current chair of the Canadian Sociological Association's Black Caucus and is directing, directing research funded through SHRC, the Russell Sage Foundation, and Emory University. She is the director of the Black Studies Institute and an associate professor of criminology at the University of Windsor. <laughs> then we have our own Dr. Cheryl Collier, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences and Professor of Political Science at the University of Windsor. She researches and publishes in the areas of comparative women's movements, Canadian federal and pro pro provincial child care and anti-violence against women policy, federalism, provincial politics, comparative feminist institutionalism, and violent, 
violence against women in politics. She has published a variety of journals, included, uh, including the Canadian Journal of Political Science, Politics and Gender, Social Politics, and Parliamentary Affairs. She's co-editor with Jill Vickers and Joan Grace of Gender, Diversity, and Federalism uh, in 2020, and Gender-Based Violence in the Me Too Era forthcoming uh, at the University of Toronto Press, and another forthcoming book, The Politics of Ontario, second edition from the University of Toronto Press. She is principal investigator on a five-year social sciences and humanities research council funded insight development project titled Gendering Canada's Legislatures, a comparative examination of federal, provincial and territorial efforts to combat racism and sexual harassment in politics. She is also currently uh, serving as past president of the Canadian Political Science Association. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Mira Williams is the acting law librarian at the University of Windsor's Law Library. She speaks and writes about library civi civic tech and how to imagine better futures with others. She writes and publishes a Saturday morning newsletter called Unity University of Winds, and you should all subscribe to it. Just Google University of Winds and Mira Williams. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I do want to uh, set out a few, uh, just set out the, the, the procedure for the people who are joining us in, um, in online. You can start putting your questions um, in the chat. And for the others, we will hold off the questions until the end. We're go I'm going to go through four questions with the panelists. And after that, we'll open the floor for questions. So we'll try to probably speak for between 45 minutes or so to have maybe an hour max. Um, then from then on, we will, uh, we will have a group discussion with everyone. OK, so. Um, The first question I have for the panelists is, please discuss the importance of having diverse representation in our public institutions. So I'm going to ask Emmanuel to go first. Dr. Richet. Thank you, Jane. Bonsoir tout le monde. <laughs> so I'd like to answer this question uh, from a political science perspective, which is my uh, discipline. So in political science, there are different ways of thinking of political representation. And one traditional way is to conceive of political representatives as trustees. So public office holders uh, will mainly rely on their own judgment to make political decision. And we are supposed to trust them to make political decisions that will benefit um, the greatest good. The problem with this model of representation is that public office holders will make decisions based on their values, knowledge, and experiences. But if you have public office holders from the same background, their collective decisions will be um, based on a limited worldview. Even if they have the best of intentions, their decisions are likely to have negative impacts on people of other background, especially if they have unconscious biases and prejudices. This is why I think there is a value of adopting what is called mirror representation. The idea here is that political representatives should mirror the social makeup of society. Within public institutions, different groups should be represented in similar proportions to those that exist in the wider population. 
This way we can ensure that all values, all knowledge and all experiences are taken into account in view of producing better public policy. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Cheryl? Two political scientists in a row. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny, I, I wrote the same thing down <laughs> that Emma did. Uh, we could go more into, but I, I, I won't do that. I actually wrote something else that I was thinking about this as well. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming today as well and for uh, the great questions that were put together. And I think this is so important to have this this discussion and, and it's really heartening to see uh, all of, all this great turnout and, and engagement. Um, I'm going to say that this is a, uh, it's uh, the importance of having diverse representation in public institutions is everything. Um, it, if we purport to have a democracy, which I think we do in Canada, we want to make sure that that democracy has a healthy level of representation. And uh, to kind of build off of uh, Emma's comments on the kinds of representatives that you, or the ways that you can represent, you want to think about the richness of um, of our society and making sure that that is represented. So you're mirroring society, but you're also acting for that those people in society. And of course, your lived experience gives you the tools to act for people in a society. If you don't have that representation, then your democracy is not healthy because you're only having a very short, a small portion of a society represented, uh, making decisions, setting agendas, and then you will uh, have a, uh, a really a poor uh, um, governing body, no matter where it is, whatever the public institution is that we're talking about. So we talk about politics, but of course, this is in every space that you have any kind of decision making. You want to make sure that you have representation from everyone that uh, is affected by the decisions you're making. Um, I uh, was thinking about an example of this that um, uh, that I use uh, or have used for students in the past. Um, and uh, it's um, it came up again, interestingly enough, in a, a publication called The Conversation. Uh, which is a, um, uh, a knowledge dissemination uh, space for academics across Canada. Um, it's picked up in the news often, and um, I noticed uh, just earlier this month there was an example of uh, the consequences of people in decision-making uh, positions that do not represent um, society properly. And it's actually in the area of health. Um, if you think about uh, the impacts of uh, uh, disease uh, or, or health problems on society, um, if we want to understand and be able to help people so that they can actually be healthy in a society, we have to have a good understanding of uh, the variety of people that can be affected by disease. Um, what we do know in the area of heart disease that um, it uh, heart disease is a horrible uh, condition that uh, kills two and a half million people uh, per uh, uh, per year around uh, uh, in North America, I believe. Uh, but if you look at who is affected the most by heart disease, it's actually women. Um, but we have done very little research over time on the impacts of heart disease on women. So uh, about 50% of women will die because they do not have the heart disease diagnosed. Uh, the symptoms are not the same as, as uh, in male identified patients. And this is, you know, this is still ongoing today because uh, funded research and the decisions made by people to fund research uh, two thirds of that research has uh, used male identified subjects as uh, the uh, the uh, the research uh, base. So you know, there's this. I think it's a good example because it shows you the impact of not having people in decision making power when grants are given or when you're tr trying to decide what a research project should look like or how it should uh, come to be. Um, it, they're literally deadly. And, and these are things that we know about, but they still continue. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think this is such an important conversation for us to, to query when representation is not uh, at the level of diversity it needs to be. 
Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Ron John, would you like to go next? Great. <clears throat> thank you, Jane. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, University President Robert Gordon for sponsoring and supporting the event. Um, I'm very proud to be part of this panel with my esteemed colleagues and, and friends. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that we do at the University of Windsor uh, to see many students and faculty here. I think we should be proud of our local university. Um, it is a, a top-notch institution. Uh, and it's one where we are working very hard. Challenges are there, but working very hard to make uh, as an inclusive a campus as possible where everybody can feel like University of Windsor is a place for them. <laughs> Politics gets a bad rap, but it's vitally important. Um, it's noble work. Uh, it's great to see some politicians and candidates uh, here this evening. Uh, and it can also be fun. Uh, sometimes knocking on doors is fun. It's a great way to get to know your, your community and get to know your neighbors. That said, for more than a century, sociologists have drawn attention to and analyzed the challenges of political representation in complex dynamic societies. For instance, elected representatives can claim to speak for or on behalf of the people conflating their interests with the public and just go and do what they want. Unsurprisingly, this can erode civic engagement and lead to a sclerotic democratic culture. Our political system is typically too remote from people to adequately appreciate and respond to very concrete and practical needs from a wide uh, variety of sectors. The state also suffers for this because it lacks information and a genuine sustained democratic dialogue required for understanding social dynamism. Migration and diversity are part of that, of that dynamic. I really like Windsor. I, I chose to move here a decade ago. It has a distinctive working class cosmopolitan vibe driven by many waves of migration. I like the industrial pride here, pride in working hard. People from all over make a life for themselves here and create new forms of belonging. This is a cosmopolitanism from below. Not, not the cosmopolitanism of business, cultural, polit or political elites. Rather, it's about workers coming here and making a life. The city could do more to foster that. It's a significant part of the city's potential. Public leadership and public oversight in the public interest should reflect this cosmopolitan potential and deepen democratic governance by reaching out to those who are part of it, living it, and making it work. Collectively, we can do more to let people know about what it means to participate on boards that serve as important mediators between a remote and clumsy centralized state and the reality and demands of daily life. But representation in public institutions where major decisions are made and then have a duty to serve the public tend to be staffed by those relatively well placed in the social hierarchy. Class position comes to be reflected in governance. Those making and enforcing the rules, designing the process, Surprise, surprise, rely on their experience, their expertise, but this is to the detriment of workers, newcomers, and vulnerable groups who lack the resources, connections, and know-how about the full range of civic engagement. Class inequality in public, public governance thus alienates the people they are supposed to, supposed to serve. Bureaucracy can also mean fetishizing proceduralism, formality, and process at the cost of substantive result. We can have great rhetoric, but if reality doesn't reflect it, then the public isn't getting what it needs. Technocratic domination is also a real problem. Pressing social issues and needs cannot be reduced to questions of social administration at the expense of serious political discourse concerning the factors shaping our future and fate and actively discussing what kind of future we want. We must be attentive to how we problematize our future. It will be difficult, often uncomfortable work, but it still needs to be done. Otherwise, we'll be stuck with leadership in public institutions, unsympathetic to and ignorant of the needs of a diverse community. Reproducing the status quo just won't do. Thank you. Would, Mira, would you like to go next? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but I'm here. I don't have any notes. Um, I am a librarian. I'm for a long-standing interest in civic issues. Um, and like many of us, I think we just want to make 
our neighborhoods better, our cities better. Some years ago, um, coming from libraries, I think libraries have a space, like it's a civic space, it's a civic indoor space. And many years ago, I worked with some wonderful people in the Windsor Public Library to make a what's known as a, uh, it was an unconference. It was uh, called a change camp, Windsor Essex Change Camp. And to ask her, like, what could, how can our city get better in the age of public participation? This is when the internet, we thought the internet um, was a, maybe a better and healthier place than it is now. One of the things that I'm interested in, and I'd, I'd like to explore, and I'd, I'd love to hear more from the audience, um, is this idea of, of what are, how do we want to represent ourselves as citizens in our city. Um, I was very involved with a uh, electoral reform project called Rank Ballots Windsor. And in doing that, I was doing some research. I'm not a professional historian. I'm not a professional political scientist. And I was shocked to learn that uh, in 1972, uh, that was the year in Ontario where they finally struck um, provisions in which you uh, renters could not vote. Um, essentially, they struck home ownership as a condition for voting. And so if we understand the the enterprise of the ability of enfranchising of voting, when Canadians first came here, uh, it was white men who owned property uh, that was enfranchised, left uh, eventually to women, sorry, I closed my mic, uh, to women, um, and to, and we had religious restrictions. Um, indigenous peoples also, it was very late for in order to vote. So this idea that the person who only cared about their city was a person who owned land. That was the, that was the only person who was deemed enough to be, um, had worth in the city to actually decide things. And, th and this transition is still going on. There are still people who think that um, there are people who are immigrants that come over, they, they risk everything, they start over, they want a better life for their children, um, they, they start businesses here, they, they bring their kids to school, and they can't vote because they're not Canadian citizens, right? There is, and so there are movements, for example, starting in Toronto. Imagine all the people in Toronto who are not Canadian citizens, who live very li vibrant lives and cannot vote. Uh, why is the voting age, could we drop the voting age? Because we know that, you know, young people have a lot to stake and they feel disenfranchised. So I, one of the other ways that we can look into uh, this whole idea of public participation is like sort of through a longer arc of history. And um, I'm really excited. And I think, as I said, the, the, the turnout here is wonderful. People really care about this. And uh, this, is, uh, this is just another chapter in a longer story. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and everyone that is on the screen. Um, thank you too, but mostly <laughs> it's a cold night. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for, for caring about what's happening in our city, what's happening in our country, right? what the trajectory is here. I want to attend to the question um, as a sociologist, but also as a person in the world. Um, if there is nothing that sociology teaches about representation, it's that in the absence of representation, difference becomes deviance. And in the absence of equitable power relationships in a democracy, deviance becomes criminal. And that's not actually okay. We do not sit alone in Windsor. We don't sit alone in Canada. We are on a continent. We are in a world. And we are about five seconds away from a place that is currently 20 years into the historically most profound experiment in mass incarceration in world history. This is not just an academic question, though we know a lot about it academically. When we talk about you know, I mean, I'm going to be, I'm going to put on my person hat for a minute. I'm a person. My name is Natalie. So I was at a, I was at a restaurant. I won't name it. You're going to know what I'm talking about. And I was sitting right, with uh, four girlfriends right, and uh, two, two black women, um, two South Asian. 
and one of indigenous descent. And we're sitting, we're stone cold chilling, we're laughing about our kids. Really normal stuff. Living our lives. And sure enough, first comes the server to say we're being too loud. Then comes the manager. Now that might be on me. <laughs> Here's what I want you to hear. Okay. Some people are louder than other people. It's difference. It's difference. Sometimes I'm sitting with some of y'all and I'm like, really, do you not react at all? Like no reaction? <laughs> um, and that's difference. When there is no representation in leadership, when leadership looks the same, when leadership has the same lived experiences and the same life story, okay, now we're not talking about difference. We're talking about too loud. We're talking about needs to leave. And all too often, we're talking about no, no, no. People can have the most benevolent intentions. That doesn't save anybody. Because without representation, difference becomes deviance. And deviance becomes criminal. The sociological literature tells us again and again that um, my frankly laughable experience in a restaurant can be mapped on to, to fundamental abuse of power in a democracy. And it is dangerous. And we have the responsibility as members in a democracy to say, excuse me, who's making these rules? Excuse me, don't like that. And it becomes our moral obligation. Um, I forgot the original question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Um, thank, thank you for all the great answers. And you can also put your questions in the chat while, while you think of them. Um, oh, I also want to acknowledge um, we have two students helping us, Jasmine Knight and Lila Iriburiro Happy, who are going to be taking your questions, taking notes. Um, and of course, the tech people as well. Thank you. So I have a second question and OK. No, no, I'm saying, I'm okay, close. I'm oh, OK. My second question is, how do you think people's diverse attributes, lived experiences and positionalities contribute to public engagement? Um, should I let Laurent John go first? Um, uh, for me, cosmopolitanism from below um, means that people find a way from, regardless of where they've come from, of cooperating, sharing knowledge um, on a day-to-day -day basis in their neighborhood, wherever, um, to, to get life done. From finding out when you move to a new place, I've moved plenty. I know the difficulties and challenges of where do you go to get your car fixed, or where's a good hardware store, or where do I go grocery shopping? Um, that that's happening here in Windsor on a daily basis. Uh, we have lots of newcomers. We have our international students, people migrating from across the country from from uh, the U.S. into into Windsor. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a cosmopolitanism from below. It reflects a generosity that makes doing life possible, and we could do more to valorize that. It's super important. Let's valorize it. Let's facilitate it. Um, people doing social life, regular people doing social life can tell us a lot about the adequacy of our public infrastructure and where we need to invest. Um, our public transit could use some more investment. It's it's a it's an issue for us at the university. Um, I need some way to get to work. I take the bus. I, I'm a proud user of the number two crosstown. And every now and again, I'll do my number two crosstown tour of the city. You know, go from sandwich all the way to Tecumseh Mall and and have have some fun. Um, but because uh, I'm a people as well, right? Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, where where where's where where are the needs? Uh, 
Windsor is famous for two very historic neighborhoods, Sandwich and Old Walkerville or Walkerville. Um, neither of them have a proper community center. Uh, Walkerville doesn't have a public library branch, right? Um, historic neighborhood, where are we gonna put the archives such that they're accessible to people? Um, that's stuff of public in infrastructure, that facilitates civic engagement. Uh, and people wanting to do that, yeah, that that message needs to needs to get needs to get out there. Uh, an odd online survey, the occasional online survey, the occasional town hall isn't good enough. Relationships matter. Uh, relationships and neighborhoods matter. We need more leadership that understands that. Uh, diversified public boards are also a crucial intermediary and a place where debating and deliberating uh, on the public good can and should happen. Public oversight and the public interest needs to needs to happen, and that neighborhood and local basis is a really important way to do that. Uh, we might want to foster greater equity in governance and in our political life. Well, how are we going to mentor um, another generation to do that unless we facilitate collectively the opportunities for young people, uh, anybody, a newcomer who doesn't know our political system, doesn't know the ins and outs of political political um, governance at the municipal level. Um, how, how do we facilitate that? We need to do that outreach and that work. That's where the, the, the impact of regular uh, people can have a, have a, have a uh, uh, beneficial impact on having cosmopolitan governance reflected in, in how we run our city and, and, and make it happen. People from all over the country and all over the world have moved here. They know something about what's worked and hasn't in the places they've come from. Let's build on that. But that won't happen without a commitment to diversity and in public institutional leadership. Thank you. Emma? Okay, so I'd like to answer the question uh, based on my own personal experience as an immigrant woman who is a francophone and who is of Vietnamese background. Being a member of several disadvantaged and underrepresented groups makes you aware of many inequities and injustices like racism, sexism, xenophobia, etc. And it becomes really hard not to engage in politics um, because you feel it deep down inside that you, you have to fight um, against these injustices. And as a professor who enjoys a certain level of socioeconomic privilege, I see it as my duty to publicly engage. And so I'm doing it uh, in my classroom teaching, I'm doing it through my research, and I'm doing it through my activities outside of work. My lived experiences have also made me a more conscientious public official. So in my work as school board trustee, I understand that I can never perfectly put myself in, in somebody else's shoes. And so therefore, I always put the emphasis on consulting as many stakeholders as possible to ensure that the decisions I make uh, will benefit everyone. Thank you. Um, I think um, I can answer this a couple of ways. So um, the first thing I want to say is there's an expectation, I think, that um, people that are publicly engaged should do things a certain way. And I think that's a problem. Um, I think that assumes that there is a commonality of experience or that there is a right way or a wrong way to do things. And I think it's reflective of the fact that uh, people that have had leadership positions in public spaces are they are similar looking people with similar backgrounds, uh, you, you know, things that we've been talking about already. And I think it really limits our potential as a society when you do not include the richness of the population that um, is around you. Um, we, I don't think, have involved enough people of diverse um, 
perspectives, lived experiences uh, across the spectrum, um, we're not even coming close to doing the kind of of inclusive leadership that I think would really benefit society. So there's a lot of really positive potential I see in moving more fulsomely in that direction. Um, otherwise, we're going to really repeat what we already know. And a lot of times that's really not working very well. Um, I also want to talk about engagement um, through seeing yourself in positions of leadership. If you don't see yourself in those spaces, you'll, you'll, you won't engage, you won't think that I could ever be that. I think we have a responsibility for um, everyone that wants to, to be involved, particularly young people, our students, even, even our prospective students, really young uh, children, uh, to be able to say you belong in uh, positions of power, you belong in decision making spaces. And if we continue to just replicate the same old, same old, they never will see that. They won't aspire to those positions. And I think that's a real sad uh, future for our society. Do you want to go? Yeah, I oh, you want to go? <laughs> After this, we've got to shorten that. Okay. Um, I have a hard time with this question for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things I've been trying to think about is just the reframing of the question, because I think one of the questions about public representation is that we fall into this understanding that there's like two types of people in the world. There are decision makers and then there are people who can give their opinion. And that's not our lived experience. We're all full people. We make full decisions. And there are many people who are like, why doesn't our world reflect that? Um, I'm not a disability expert, a disability activist, but one of the things I know that I want to learn more about that particular activist group is that they've just done amazing work of saying nothing for us without us. The very act of, you know, having a benevolent person saying, you know, we're going to make decisions on your behalf. When the very act of making the decisions of how you want to live your life makes, that's the thing that makes you who you are. Those choices enable you. That's, that's what makes us a person is being able to have full agency and full actions. And so when we don't have representation, if we don't have a full representation, we are literally less, less people. One of the challenges of this question of like, why is diversity good? I always feel like it's like, why is spicy food good? Like, it's just you like a little spice in your world. Like it's not one of it. And, and I understand this. We want to we want to persuade decision makers. We want to persuade people, hey, you know, give us a try. Uh, <laughs> we are great. We're not nearly as scary as you think we are. Like, we don't want to do that, right? Um, and But we, we, we want to engage in, in, in forms in which we are, we want to make positive social change and we want to be included. And so we, we tend to say, you know, reduce groupthink, have more perspectives. It's good for business. And these are very important ways to communicate the need. We can't forget, however, that the reason why we're in the situation is that there is opportunity hoarding. There is power that's being withheld. There are people who are interested. And that's if the fact that there are people who are passionate, who really want to make a change in this world, and they cannot get onto positions where they can make those changes, there are resist forces of resistance. And I like to think of the frames of opportunity hoarding, like power hoarding. And we need to point that out. And it's uncomfortable. And as we know, we, we're here and we want to speak about the sort of the rich experiences. And this question is, 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 is really trying to get at what we're losing, because I think that's the other important part. It's not the individual who wants to run for power or like a, a elected office or um, even, you know, you know, somebody on their local, I don't know, their local floor or something to that extent. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm losing words. It's not just their loss of our experience, we're losing out. We're not getting the best people. We're, as a community, if we're not getting this, a full breadth of our community, it's everyone's loss. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question I'm actually going to just ask a couple of volunteers, so we won't go through everyone. Um, but before I we go there, how many people do we have uh, joining us online? 35. Yay, let's just give a shout out to them. OK, um, who wants to take the next question? Oh, I didn't even read out the question, did I? OK, how has the university or your classes awakened students to engage in their own com in their community? So I'll just who wants to go? Does any a couple of volunteers? Two of us are going, I'll go. Um, I think that we Sociological literature on the scholarship of teaching and learning clearly demonstrates, and I think that um, you don't know what to ask until you have the education to question what you're being presented. How do courses in criminology, how do courses in critical studies, how do courses in the Faculty of Arts, Humanity, and Social Sciences work to trouble the existing notions of burgeoning, of burgeoning Windsorites, so that they can even think to question the way that things are currently set up, the way that things don't work. It is not inevitable, it is not organic, it is not natural that we are dysfunctional in the particular ways that we are dysfunctional. Many other places have solved it by doing something completely different. It's only not palatable because it means that people who currently hold power won't hold the same amount of power and they don't want that. And I get that, like, I wouldn't want to give up power either. That's not what democracy is about. That's not what meritocracy is about. That's not what, what equity, diversity, and inclusion are about. What do students learn in this setting? They learn to at least not accept it as inescapable. And I think that that's the heart of what education is. I hear a lot about, um, a lot about credentials lately. A lot about who has substance lately. Uh, this, is, this is sociology 101, y'all. Credentials are deeply gendered and deeply racialized and deeply self-fulfilling. I always tell the same story. Oh, I'm supposed to keep it short. <laughs> I just I just saw Dr. Ku's look and I, I deserve it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave it at how are students able to engage by engaging the same as the people in this room and most especially the students in this room. I see you. Thank you for coming. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to give a couple of examples. So um, I teach women, gender, and politics, or I did anyways before I got this other job uh, as dean. Um, <laughs> I don't have as much time to teach, any, which makes me sad. It really does. Uh, but it was uh, it, it, it was one of my favorite classes because I was able to um, meet students from across campus so they weren't just political science students some um, nursing students i'd exchange students that didn't understand the canadian politics part so had to fill back fill that in a little bit but um you know i would have students of all genders um in in the classroom and they were everyone was able to kind of connect to something that we talked about um uh and for some, it was really quite revelatory. Um, not everybody. So some people, they were just hearing these things for the first time. We, you don't talk a lot about gender in high school, um, although I know there was a gender project for a while uh, to, to bring in uh, gender classes into into high schools. So uh, it's it's rare that students get that that ability to uh, to kind of query from a uh, you know kind of questioning uh, what gender is, how they relate to it. Um, and for some students, they really felt seen for the first time. And there, there's something really powerful about that um, and being able to recognize um, people for or students 
in my classes anyways, for who they are and them being able to really explore that further. And there's lots of classes they can take in sociology and and uh, in uh, they can read in the library. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that they can kind of continue to uh, to connect. Um, I had a couple of students so that uh, that did some work with me uh, on the, uh, the the research body we have at the University of Windsor called the Health Research Center for the Study of Violence Against Women. Um, and uh, neither of these two students were uh, knew much about the the uh, you know kind of facts behind violence, um, the intersections across a number of disciplines on campus. Um, but they ended up uh, really get, uh, you know, kind of getting really interested in, in investigating the, the phenomenon from, from a, a variety of perspectives. One of my students uh, went on to law school at the University of Windsor um, and pursued this uh, uh, further. She had a, a blog about uh, sexual sexism and sexual violence in the legal profession that she wrote about. Um, and she went on to become a Crown Attorney and specialized in, uh, in uh, investigating sexual violence, which I think is, it's not a place she ever would have gone, you know, from high school if she hadn't come to the university and really gotten interested in that, in that, um, that issue. And now she's on the front lines. We know how important it is uh, for, um, lawyers and uh, police officers to understand the phenomenon of, of violence and from a gendered perspective, from racialized perspectives, from class perspectives, from uh, a disability perspective. It's, it's different in all of those spaces. And our students really get the opportunity to explore that and take that knowledge and that expertise and then give back to their community. And I think that's really powerful and uh, it's what I love the most about our jobs. Thank you, Cheryl. I know I know the others have uh, things to say about this, but we can try to incorporate it during discussion. But I do have one more question before we break into discussion, and that is to ask uh, maybe Natalie could speak to this. Um, given that we now have the new Black Studies Institute, how can Black Study Institute work towards building alternative ways of knowing in the university? I love that question. I want to I want to I want to speak briefly to what what um, what you mean by alternative way of knowing, right? And I want to validate that as a term and validate it as a as a, as a as a critical way of thinking about the the way that people see the world and and that that is different. And that there are different trajectories and there are different paths. Um, when we talk about the way that we see the world in a, a, an Anglo dominant Canadian space, there's all sorts of ideas that we take for granted and we think are inescapable. So time rules everything. Time is money. Y'all heard that? That's not true. Time is not money. Those are two different things. Or else you wouldn't have to say time is money. Uh, who is who is moral? Who is smart? The ways in which we prove value and worth and how attached that is to, to money. But what do we actually need the money for? No one's troubling that. The way that we attach our sense of, of inherent goodness to the material possessions that we have accumulated? I don't even need you to change your mind. Do whatever you want, value yourself however you like, but don't think there's no other way, many other ways. When we talk about the Black Studies Institute and the ways in which it opens the floor for alternative ways of knowing at the University of Windsor, we are suggesting at the University of Windsor and only at the University of Windsor in Canada, the way that black people are, it's fine. I'm literally being quiet on purpose. <laughs> I appreciate the applause, but I meant so you could like hear me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was awesome as well, thank you. Um, 
what does the Black Studies Institute mean? In terms of the University of Windsor asserting that just because there is difference doesn't mean there has to be suppression, doesn't mean there has to be silencing, doesn't mean there has to be marginalization. No, no. There can be a Black Studies Institute instead. And none of y'all have to change your minds about the way that you're living at present, but there are other perfectly valid ways of doing life, and that's kind of revolutionary. Thank you for that question. I love that question. Should we let Natalie have the last word and then open the floor? I just had the last word. That was the last word. Yeah, that was the last word. Okay, that's the last word. All right, okay. <laughs> all right, now we open the uh, questioning for the, all the audience participants. Uh, thank you very much. That was a dream team of panelists. So we learned we learned a lot. Um, I really like what you guys were saying about representation. I'm a huge believer. You can't be what you can't see. So we need people to represent um, on these boards. But how much of this difficulty is systemic? How much is it deeply rooted? We can get as many people of different um, racialized backgrounds, different gender to sit on these boards, be a part of these institutions. But what about the system itself? What if it's the problem? If so, what can we do? Because these are just Band-Aid remedies, right? So, but thank you, that was, uh, and I wanna hear your story. I know you're, you're cut out, but I'm very curious about, you said that you wanted to share a story, but maybe some other time. You wanna hear that story? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the best question of all. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but thank you very much. I just wanted to know how much is it systemic and what, what can we do to combat the deeply rooted system because it's great we can add people to boards we can encourage students be uh, you can't be what you can't see very important but but what if the system is against the one step forward ten step back thank you very much i see the university as the problem i see that standing up and doing the moral ethical thing for me, that was saying no to not giving up my accommodation, to be promptly arrested and thrown out of the university, and no one at the university would listen. When I go to class, I'm under threat of arrest every day if I use my disability accommodation. I cannot make the university see that their policies. Donovan, I just want to make sure there's a question. I'm sorry, but I, I don't want to lose your train of thought. I want to be able to respond, right? So how do I get the university as an institution to come to the table to honestly engage, not to say you're wrong, we're the strong ones, we hold the power. Got it. Thank you, Donovan. I appreciate that question. And I think there's so one more before we, we respond. Should, yeah, before, can we, one more? Thank you. Okay. You want to respond Would, first? Do you want, are we going to do three, like three you do more? at okay. conferences? All right. All right. So, so there's we'll one, one more and then we'll take them on. Who would like to ask the third question? All right. So what do you say to someone in a position of power who says those who are seek with, seeking equity, diversity, and inclusion are furthering an agenda? I'll take the first question. If you, okay, I'm gonna. I'll. I'm gonna talk a little bit about systemic pieces because I think it's important to not be discouraged by systemic um, and perpetuating inequality and uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, um, ableism, etc. And it, it's hard sometimes to um, to have enough kind of energy to want to take that on because it's it's been here for a long time. And um, I, uh, 
I I kind of hear the frustration, even though I it, you know, and, and I think it's a collective frustration, and sometimes I do. I remember the first time I went to a, a graduate class um, on uh, just thinking about diversity, and I I walked out of it, and I I said it's like a mountain that is so big, and I felt so small that I couldn't climb that mountain because it seemed like all I was hearing was all the problems like it's so hard it's been here for such a long time and uh, I you know what what I took away from that is is you know, learning from others um, collectively and working together can really help to uh, to combat systems and I think you know, uh, you're seeing a little of that here, which is nice. Uh, and and I think the fact that people are engaging here is uh, considering some of the conversations recently is is a good example. I also study feminist institutionalism, which is really a um, it's kind of taking institutions and trying to see how you disrupt them. How do you gender them? How do you how do you make them represent representative of of you know, people um, when they were created by property. You know, Mita was talking about the history of who could vote, um, who made decisions. Well, we know. You know, you can look at a picture of the the fathers of Confederation, right? There's no mothers. There's no Indigenous people. There's no, right? It's a bunch of white property. Um, uh, you know, upper class uh, uh, cisgender uh, men. Um, so institutions were created in a certain way. How do we usurp those institutions? We need people to be involved and start to kind of look at those foundations and start to change them. It's not easy, um, but if you know what the challenge is, I think you you can start to chip away at it. It's it is a long term project. I won't lie, um, but you know um, I've been around for a little bit of time on the planet, not not. Uh, a lot of time, but I have seen some change. So I think from my time in grad school, when I thought about being that little person and the big mountain and not being able to climb it, I feel a little bit more hopeful that we're making some progress. And uh, I think that's an important takeaway is that I think we can change systems. We can change institutions um, if we work together and we you know, we don't go backwards because sometimes, you know, with movements, you go forward and then someone's wanting to pull you back. Uh, they don't want to share the power. They don't want to share the the spotlight. Um, but, you know, the the it, I, I have sociologists on stage with me here. They know this better than I. But the the waves of of uh, you know the tarot waves of of contestation will get it, it'll gather steam again. So you just have to keep at it. Is what I'm kind of trying to say. Any other takers? When you're trying to challenge the status quo, uh, the people in power are going to feel threatened. And that's normal, but that shouldn't discourage you. If you feel that what you're doing is uh, for a greater good, just keep at it and, and don't be discouraged, if, even if you're being demonized. I just want to ask and try to answer the question about the agenda. And I think that's something where we can all, uh, everybody in the room, if that question is being raised, is to make sure that um, we challenge some of those questions. Uh, we need to ask people when someone says they have an agenda, you're, we need to ask the person who's asking that question, um, why are you making this sound like there is some sort of hidden uh, hidden ulterior motive. Why cannot we? Why um, are you putting a person into bad faith? Um, why are some? Um, is that a question that you ask everyone? Uh, what is the unsaid thing that happened? No, it's not. <laughs> um, and so one of the what I'm very curious about is in social movements. Um, is the articul is is the work that goes into how do we articulate clearly what we what we would want? Um, from our democratic and from all of these institutions um, and make sure we ask those really difficult questions to um, the people who ask those questions. I, what I'm just trying to say is 
if somebody is asking about an agenda to someone else, it don't let that one person answer the question. If you feel that they're asking too much of someone, uh, we all need to speak up to that. Um, I, I also think that I, I want to answer this question a little bit. I also think that uh, uh, they ought to be people who work outside of the system. And that is very actually complements the work that's done within the system, because within the system, sometimes you it's much harder to actually work within the system because you have to be you have to navigate between the institutional voice and your own real voice, right? Um, and it's actually quite hard. And when you sit on the outside and you do the critique outside, you're much more able to make the challenges and be the voice of authority in a different way because you have the credibility of being working outside a system. So that, um, so yes, there's some advancement for people within the system in the institutional fashion, but it also you also tend to lose a lot more credibility by working within the system. So I, I do see the importance and the, the necessity of having those complements. Um, those are equally important in some ways. Um, we do have some questions online, so I want to take those two questions online and then pick up one more question outside uh, from here. Uh, so one is from Peter E.J. Does the fact that we discussing rep representation in public places not question our democracy? Not. Is that OK? And then I'll read out the other questions. How can we as citizens of Windsor create positions of representation for our most vulnerable? For example, migrant workers, what would that look like? And how can we work towards representation for them and the like? That's from Dana Carter and then from Jen Meyer. It was mentioned that we need representation that mirrors our population, but I'm curious, how do you believe we can go about making sure that our representation is truly mirror, mirroring our population, especially when things like our census data inherently leave people out? especially the unhoused populations or people of multiply marginalized communities. So we have three questions to go. Um, I think that if we decide that uh, democracy is categorical, right, then that's uh, less helpful, right, than if we understand that there is a spectrum of state fragility. Saying that our democratic institutions in Canada are not as representative as they could or should be, right, does A, question the status of our democracy, right, and B, is still conceivable by us as citizens of a democratic nation. Like both of those things are true simultaneously. Um, but I want to think about this question of what about people who are excluded entirely? Um, and what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm particularly interested by the question in Windsor, Essex of the Latinx population. So I am appalled. I don't use that word lightly. By the ways in which we have structurally decided that people who are here right, for a specific labor purpose do not count as people in any meaningful legal way. Right? Being a human being is a biological status. Being a person is legal, political, and social. As people sitting in a room engaged in a conversation, right? we understand this distinction. Um, the idea that what we need when we talk about representation is not to talk about people, but empower people so that they're so that they are heard as opposed to systematically structurally silenced. What do you do when you have excluded an entire population through legislation from full personhood? If you're going to say something as a scholar, as a criminologist, as a sociologist, you should say it responsibly and you should and you should you should take responsibility for the repercussions of what you're saying. I cannot sit here and listen to the question about migrant workers in Windsor, Essex and talk about okay, how we need to work to lift them up. 
smile. It's so much more than that. And the fact that we sit here talking about post-colonialism, while y'all have heard this out in the county, where where is your owner? They did Spanish dueño. And the way that that's leveraged in the county? Um, the problem is, is is so deep. What I do know, though, is that to do it any justice, right. one has to engage with the fact that you have a moral obligation to be part of an incremental solution everywhere you have the opportunity, every time with no exception, and no more, because or else you get bogged down and this is all impossible. When you're like, well, what about this? And what about this? And we can never fix it. And it's too giant. It's an excuse for inaction. That's all that is. I hear you. I've done it myself. I know the move. What we know we have to do is ensure that we have representative public institutions. We've, we're already doing it. Right? We're moving forward already. It's in motion. And then what does it look like? to include Latinx people? And then what does it look like to engage through that representation that is effective with the laws that quit people of their personhood? And then what does it look like to have meaningful equity in a county and a city we can be proud of? That's a chronology, y'all. Um, and I don't think it should ever be used as an excuse to, to turn away. That's my thoughts about that. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna try to answer these questions first. Um, on the agenda question, I, I apologize. I drew a blank. Drew a blank. Um, on the systemic question, I mean, one of the things that we as sociologists do is look at the complexity of institutions. Um, and what we find is that institutions aren't necessarily coherent or integral, that they're cross cut with all kinds of contradictions, um, and some of those are built into them. Uh, it's important to exploit those. Um, it's easy for board members or you're sitting on committees, here's the agenda, read the minutes, here's the motion, all in favor, motion to adjourn. But reminding people and stating it, it's say, hang on a second, we have a public interest Where's that reflected here now on this decision, on this motion, or in this agenda? Or why is this item being constantly deferred? No more, let's talk about it now. Um, so that's that's part of citizenship, uh, learning how to do that and being comfortable doing that. Um, yeah, insisting on, well, where is the public interest in, in this? Are we, are we just ticking boxes here? Um, or are we actually engaged in the work? So that's that's one bit. The second, and we've we've seen it, um, here over the past two or three weeks. Um, there's another sociological saying, transgression proves the rule. When the line is crossed, you get to see the relations of ruling. Here in Windsor, in our municipal governance, a line's been crossed. Everybody knows it now. The public conscience, the conscience collective, the public conscience has been pricked. We know that now. What's, what has happened is unacceptable. Everybody knows it's unacceptable. Um, that's a big leverage point for seeing change. We've seen that happen at the University of Windsor. I think uh, especially faculty members here and students, um, given the egregious incidents of anti-Black racism that the university had, had been suffering from, looking where the university's come in, th in three years. Three years from today, it was a mess. Three years ago, uh, we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to confront it. We didn't know what to do about it. Uh, well, the stuff's been done. Hasn't been easy, uh, but you exploit the contradictions. You insist that, no, this isn't right, that uh, we have these incidences of anti-Black racism on the University of Windsor campus, two kilometers from Sandwich First Baptist Church, right? And I, I'm saying that this is Black History Month. 
is, is totally unacceptable. The university has to do better and we'll find a way to do better. And here we are today, three years later, we have a Black Studies Institute and our first director is sitting right here, right? So, it is difficult to uh, disrupt and transform social institutions. By nature, they tend to systemic reproduction. But given their contradictions, it's possible to do that, to exploit those contradictions. And then when a line's crossed, it's, it's just not tenable anymore. Thanks. I'd like to answer the question about mirror representation. How can we ensure that our institutions are more representative? Unfortunately, we cannot rely on political elites. Okay, how many times have we seen political parties running on a platform saying that they would bring about political uh, electoral reform and then once in power uh, decide, oh no, it's too complicated or it's not what we thought it would be or, oh, Canadians do not really want it, right? Um, and what we also see is political parties saying, oh, look at our slate of candidates. We have a lot of women running. We have a lot of people from uh, visible minorities running. What are they doing with these candidates? They're putting them in writings that they cannot win. They're making them sacrificial lambs, okay? So what can we do, okay? What we can do is vote, okay? And when I saw um, turnout in the last municipal election and in the last provincial election, I couldn't believe it, okay? This, this is the only power that we have and we're not using it. Why? Why? We need to go out and vote and you need to convince every person you know the day of the vote to go and vote. Yes. Okay. We have a question here. Sorry, it's not a question actually. Um, it's an answer uh, to the question about you have an agenda. Very simple answer. Yes, I do have an agenda. <laughs> I, I, I do. Um, it's an agenda um, that's based in advocacy. It's an agenda that's based in humanizing people. It's an agenda and achieving justice. It's an agenda that is based in achieving reparative justice, truth and reconciliation. Yes, I have an agenda. I'm going to pretend that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just answer Clinton's question really quick? Okay. All right, thank you. I, I just, straight up, everyone is allowed to make claims on their own behalf except for black women. Right. It is constant. I know where this question is coming from because you've seen me answer it. Okay. So, we also need to keep it real. I'm looking around this room. There are people here that have at various times, because they are trusted in-group people who have done the work of building my trust, and I have built trust with them, and they've been like, Natalie, I'm gonna need you to step back a second. And I can hear them, because sometimes you're fighting and you're fighting and you're fighting. And if you are not surrounded by people who you trust, who can say, now maybe, maybe take a minute. Okay, and this to previous questions as well. You have to be able to hear that. Not from out group, never from them. From your trusted people. If you find that you do not have those trusted people and there is no sounding board and there is no ability for you to hear, too much now. then it, it might be too much. And there needs to be that reflexivity. And it's also called self-care. 
I cannot imagine being out there by myself with someone saying, what is your agenda? Me not really knowing. Um, I think that this is also the moment when I thank the people in this room. Y'all know who you are. Right. And I know that I've done that and that I know I, I've done this for you. Right. Um, the agenda question, absolutely 100%. Right. And also when you're in group, where are we going with this? That's it. Thank you for that excellent question, Clinton. It was amazing. <laughs> So there's one question there, someone there, and then I have two questions uh, that I've been waiting. It's very, it's very quick. Um, is it gone, John? Okay. Um, the, the second question you should have asked after apologizing to the person that was offended on the university was apologize to the people in Sandwich Town because we've had to put up with this over and over and over again. And we're the ones that have gotten the black eye because it's sandwich town. And we're trying our best to uh, share a little light on the best of sandwich town. And right now we need all the help we can get. The fact that we've actually had dinner for university students uh, less than two weeks ago was amazing. But still, we still haven't heard an apology about you know, the situation that keeps cropping up in our neighborhood, which is the problem of your students that come from Canada. And we want to hear an apology from the university. I've asked for one several times. I guess the answering machine must be broken. All right, so uh, I have two questions here. One is anonymous. It's wonderful to see public conversations on formal political representation. However, I wonder if the panelists could comment on how democracy has been used as a tool of imperialism from the global south, sorry, global north towards the global south, as well as the Western assumption that democracy needs capitalism. That is, given that capitalism keeps most of the unrepresented groups at the bottom, what does their representation do for them in capitalism? And then I have another question from Urvashi Soni Sinha. While diverse representation and public leadership is essential, it is not an end in itself, but a beginning. Moreover, there could be tokenism and performative leadership. How would you deal with these contradictions? How does intersectionality play here? Good questions. Thank you for the questions. Who wants to take? <laughs> uh, okay, I'll take I'll take the one on Global South question. Um, um, I think I think a lot of the Problems that are arising today do come from uh, a globalization and imperialism that is seems to be happening elsewhere, but is very much alive here and is impacting the very way we see and understand people uh, in, within our neighborhoods, uh, on the streets, in the university. So, for example, I think about for. Um, the, a lot of the anti-China propaganda right now, which directly translates to anti-Asian hatred um, and racism. And then I see this as being repeated from the previous version of anti-Muslim racism, which is also the result of imperialism, colonialism, um, and the ongoing militarization and military intervention elsewhere that is happening. And, and it creates a condition for uh, targeting of specific groups of people. And those kinds of histories get repeated over and over again. And so in some ways, we also have to be thinking not just locally, that our local politics is very much in. Uh, created by some of these global conditions. And so to think of democracy, we have to think about 
uh, democracy beyond the liberal democratic institutions that we have. And that, as you, I think the person was also meaning that capitalism seems to be understood as the only uh, uh, part. It's it's kind of the the positive aspect of liberal democracy. Um, but I, I think it goes beyond that kind of uh, assumption of the linkage between democracy and capitalism, because there is there is very much, you know, for those of people who are Marxists and socialists, you might be thinking about other ways of being, which can also lead to good democratic governance that could lead to um, a different way of seeing people, constructing people, and then allowing them to be part of the institutions in ways that go beyond seeing, understanding democracy in a very limited sense. I don't know if that answers the question, um, I, I can't see it's somebody from online, so I, I don't know, but I'm I'm hoping that it at least gets to some of that thinking because I'm I'm certainly puzzled by a lot of what's going on elsewhere and how it impacts on us. We're, we're anything that they tell you over and over again a bunch of times before you're in grade four, you believe for the rest of your life um, until you take a, a good class. Uh, one of the things that they taught me uh, was that democracy is the best. And all of those other people, poor people, in the third world, they're not democratic. It's a dictatorship. It's so much worse. I mean, this is completely uninterrogated choose whatever you want to do but merely thinking that because there is a process and procedure around a body that you are calling democratic does not make it so we're having a whole conversation around lack of representation in democratic public institutions right now and i think that we just realized that it's not real democratic at all If it's not democratic, that means two things, implies two things. One is that that is a hypocrisy that we need to close a loop on. And two, maybe we're not better than them. <gasps> I know I just did a violence. That being said, maybe we, we as racialized, are not better than them. Them is racialized. And gendered and classed and particularly abled. Um, I love this question and I'm gonna, but I, I, I could talk about this question for, how long is a normal class at the University of Windsor? An hour and 50 minutes? All of the different constructions of moral superiority in the idea of democracy and the way that it relates to global north and global south and how we, we put that on bodies. Um, Any other takers for the other questions? I guess I can talk a slight bit about the concept of tokenism. Um, you know, I, I think when we talk about representation of democracy, we do have to think about it being meaningful and we have to think about um, not just one person and okay, we did one and we're good. And then that one person is gone the next time it's whatever the board or, or the institution is reconstituted. And then we, we check a box and say, okay, we, well, we had diversity. I, I think, we, uh, I think it's really important to think about what is enough and um, we're not close to that. So this is why I think we see a lot more of, of when people do get a space on a board or uh, a commission or a institution that they, um, they're often alone. They're not, uh, there's not a thought about the impact or um, facilitating power and facilitating uh, real 
participation and representation on that in that space. Um, we talk a lot about this in uh, in political science when we think about group representation and whether or not it hits um, what is known or uh, in literature as critical mass. So critical mass is a certain large minority or large enough of a minority. It's taken from a physics concept that it can make a difference. And I think that's the least we should be looking at. But I, I think we can strive for even more. It would be nice to see, you know, majorities that are diverse. I think in many spaces, that's what we need. And so, um, you know, critical mass is great, uh, but even striving for more uh, to avoid, uh, you know, that token uh, check a box uh, that you see sometimes. Um, it, it's really important to recognize that there are many different kinds of political culture. Um, I was raised by a Bengali father who read two or three newspapers a day. And what we talked about was over dinner, politics. Six years old, seven years old, eight years old, 10 years old, or until my father passed away. That, that was the stuff of conversation. Um, that is not uncommon for Bengalis. Um, that's not uncommon for many Indians uh, to talk and debate politics loudly, heatedly, openly, storm out of a room debating politics. Yeah, that's part of political culture. Uh, in the bastions of Upper Canada Toryism, you're hostile if you do that, right? And we have to recognize that. We have to tolerate that there are different kinds of political culture and political discourse. Um, great. Uh, Windsor is well placed to foster that. The University of Windsor is well placed to foster that. So let's let's foster and cultivate that. Um, my some of my students uh, would would recall. Uh, I've discussed this a few times about uh, everyday or mundane effervescence, the liveliness of life that actually makes life livable and enjoyable and fun. Um, part of that is a neighborhood pub. Uh, and what are the two rules in the neighborhood pub? Taboos, right? Sacred, bad sacred, like you completely excluded. Don't talk politics, don't talk religion. Um, yeah, that's the public house. Okay, but these are very white upper Canada Tory sensibilities that, okay, well, you know, we don't talk about those things here. I'm very curious in the public, the public house in the neighborhood, we have these rules. Well, then where are we going to talk about them? and talk about them openly, as we will, heatedly, and enliven our, our public discourse. So yeah, I think appreciating that there are different kinds of political cultures in the liberal democracy that we're used to um, here in Ontario, and uh, you're between Montreal, Toronto, Windsor, um, is, 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 is a norm. It's not a norm, it's one norm. Um, and often it's not that fun a norm. I, I like the Bengali debate. Well, the Guardian said this, and on on we go. Thank you. All right, we'll take we'll take three more questions. There's one here, right of the audience. There's one here. Thank you. I'm from the New York. I'm, I came down from New US I, I, or up from the US. <laughs> I uh, drove about an hour and a half. And I'm so glad I was, I, I was invited. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not overwhelmed, but I'm whelmed <laughs> by this, by the fact that you guys are doing this and that you put it together so well. I wonder if, uh, given the segregation of not only residency, but but mindset, if it's not important to have um, exposure and in, in a way that, that that changes people. I've lived in neighborhoods that were all white and then we move in and suddenly we're not so scary. Like you said, we're so I just wonder if the university would consider making these classes requirements 
as opposed to to electives. And, and, and because because if they get it, if they get it and they're exposed to it, then the lie that my that my dad told not my dad, but the lie that dad told around the table or the, the lie that they're all like that or they're like that. That's that it's the spell. It's just a thought. Another question here. So, all right, so that's true. I'll read one more question out from here. I read this quote today from Ryan. Um, he, the, the truth is ending misogynistic behavior that objectifies and demeans women in search of a laugh is inherently the work of men. Let it sink. Should I repeat it? The truth is Ending misogynistic behavior that objectifies and demeans women in search of a laugh is inherently the work of men. What roles can allies play in increasing representation and how can we recruit them? All right, so we have three questions. Who wants to take? Do you want all your classes to be mandatory? <laughs> I thought that was an excellent idea. All of our classes should be mandatory all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, I, 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 I want to address some of the questions first, right? I have a lot of thoughts. Um, number one, I, I really want to think through what all of these suggestions mean in terms of political culture. I'm blown away when Dr. Dad is talking about the ways in which Bengali culture centers in a way conflict to the end of collective growth, right? Um, we're we're, we're Afro-Cubans. All we do is politic. Fought a whole revolution about it. Um, I can't imagine a public sphere that is like the one in which we live, right? Politics and religion are in bad taste. They're in bad taste? What else is there to talk about? House paint colors? What? <laughs> How are these classes not mandatory? Because no one wants to talk about politics and religion. It's gouge. I heard tell, I'm not going to name names. I heard tell that a particular person that is in a position of considerable power said regarding this panel, I don't like conflict. Mm-hmm. Must be nice. <laughs> it must be nice to have all of the power and all of the decision making and all of the capacity to determine the lived outcomes of myself, my family, and my children and not want conflict. Mm-hmm. It's gauche to talk about politics and religion. And these are all elective courses for, you know, students like that. Now, um, I think that all of this is part of one conversation, actually, right? And it's about who is allowed to have an ideological position, who is fighting the question of survival. For whom is this required and for whom is this optional? I think the idea of representation being key to public institutional leadership is the idea that in public institutional leadership are people for whom this isn't optional. <laughs> that's it. That's what I got. Great questions, y'all. Anybody else? Well, maybe Cheryl can talk about the indigenization of the curriculum uh, at the university, but in FAS as well. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I uh, I can I I'm gonna kind of uh, 
kind of build off of the, the concept of, of uh, core classes. It's interesting what we think is core and what shouldn't be core. And, and I agree with you. I think that we should be, um, you know, not forcing students, but bringing, making it easier for them to be exposed to, um, uh, you know, different ways of knowing. And I think this is the, the beauty of the uh, interdisciplinary and critical studies uh, department that we are creating, the Black Studies Institute, um, and of course, the Indigenous uh, work that we are starting to do on campus. I'm hopeful that uh, we can build on indigeneity in ways that would make it impossible uh, to go to the University of Windsor without having to take an Indigenous course, not have to, uh, again, impossible not to take a, a course on critical studies, on Black studies, on gender studies. Um, these are, you know, this is the humanities. This is, this is, this is life. And I don't think students are getting that exposure in other spaces and I think that's the value of a university education. People wonder what is the value? What are we what are we doing? We are trying to create citizens that can solve problems. Um, if you don't want to solve problems, don't come to university. I, uh, I think that could be a slogan. Um, you don't need to trademark it by me. I'm sure somebody else said it before. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I, indigeneity um, and indigenizing the curriculum is, it's a big challenge. So, you know, thanks. <laughs> I sounded like I wanted to dodge the question. I don't, I just know that it's a really big challenge, but it's a challenge we can ill afford uh, to, to, uh, to ignore. We, we, or to, to take on, I mean, we, you know, we have a responsibility um, to, uh, you know, make sure that our students, our faculty, our staff um, know uh, and are well versed in, uh, you know, Indigenous ways of knowing. And we haven't done a good job of that to, to this point in time. Um, so we do have a long way to go to think about what, what does uh, indigenizing our curriculum mean? It's not just putting a reading on here, or it's, it's much more than that. The same as, uh, as, as taking a critical lens from uh, diversity perspectives across the spectrum of diversity, that is being human and making sure that our students uh, don't leave without uh, having that education. Um, it's, it's sometimes harder when we try to package education as something that you can take and get a job and here you go and you know you get to choose the things. I think um, you know we have a, a bigger responsibility than to just be that. Um, we are that's what university is supposed to be about. So I hope we can do a good job of uh, addressing those uh, those uh, important pieces in the years to come. Um, I know we're starting to do that here and I'm excited. I'm really excited about what Black Studies as, a, as, a, as an institute, as a program, as a center of knowledge in Canada and beyond will we'll do. Um, I'm, you know, the future is really bright. So I'm, uh, I'm, I look forward to what we're uh, what what we're going to see in the years to come, and I hope you're all going to be part of it. There was a question about allyship. Does anyone want to take that? Uh, we're all academics. We're all tenured, um, and. Yeah, with that comes responsibilities. Um, tenured academics have a tremendous amount of freedom to speak out and advocate for. Uh, I wish more of us did that. Uh, if there are academics or aspiring academics listening this evening, um, we do have a public interest that we must serve. We're here because the public wants us as part of a university, as a publicly funded and supported university, that's important. Um, so there is some role to play. I'm also a worker and a union member, and I'm proud of that. Um, so some of the alliances with broader working class movements, absolutely. 
Um, but there are risks too. Um, a big risk is technocracy. We don't want a bunch of academics running the show. The point of democracy is you have lots of voices. You hear lots of things. Uh, we can bring some expertise. Uh, technocracy is not a good thing. Uh, that's saying we're going to have some group of elite experts that are calling the shots about what's ostensibly in our best interest because they have some data to back it up. No, no, no. you got to come and talk to us. That's, that's really important. I'm very mindful of that. It's something that sociologists have pointed out for quite some time um, that, yeah, it's one thing to have uh, the best experts, um, but we don't want to have te technocracy. It runs, it, it runs counter to these basic fundamentals of doing democracy. We have only about 10 minutes. Uh, do we want to have a few last word from the panelists? I just said mine, so. <laughs> I can, I'll just say very few, uh, very few words. Anyway, so thank you, everyone. Um, Marshall McLuhan wrote a book called The City as Classroom, and I have a undergraduate degree in geography. And I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm failing at words because um, everything is really overwhelming at the moment. So I'm going to stumble at an idea. And that idea is that, um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the gentleman with the question about being in a place. And what are the natures of being in, um, we, we talked a lot about be bodies and that's crucial to the understanding of of a lot of the topics that were here, but I, what we haven't really talked about is this idea of a shared space and what it means to come from a shared space. And 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 I think we can't forget that it's we're an institution called the University of Windsor. Um, and I'm I know one of the things that I'm particularly looking forward to. I was looking through the strategic the uh, plans of the university is it really wants to make. Uh, find more ways that we can be the public institution for the city. And that's something I'm really looking forward to. So I, I, I just again want to thank everyone here for engaging with this conversation. This really does make me feel hopeful. Um, I have to say when, you know, events happen that that uh, makes me doubt that we we can make change, that we can have a better engagement, uh, you know, a public engagement uh, with our leaders uh, and, and really kind of move forward. It's these kinds of, of, of uh, events and, and conversations that really do uh, uh, make me hopeful. And I, I think we are on the right track. I think we have a long way to go. I, I, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat that part of it. But at the same time, the energy is in the right space. And even if we do see little glimmers of, of you know, people that don't get it or, you know, backlash to a lot of the progress we're making, I think, you know, the energy is really in the right space at the moment. And I'm, I, I said I was excited about uh, what's to come and I am. And I think we have a lot of really excellent People, as you're, you've seen, uh, uh, you know, a lot of them are here. A lot of them are in the audience. Uh, that uh, that make me uh, really proud of the university and where it's going. So, thanks. I was sitting in my old house in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was listening to my kids in the neighborhood kids, and there's like a dozen of them, and like they're just like, nah, 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 nah. I'm not really supervising, um, but they're kind of in my world, and I said to myself, wow, it's unbelievable, my kids are the smartest. <laughs> they're so smart, and these neighborhood kids, it, it, I, you don't own my mind, I can think whatever I want. These neighborhood kids, they're, they're, they're not smart. <laughs> um, and I thought about it, I was like, wow, it's a lot of maternal bias. Right. And then I was like, I don't actually think that my kids are better looking and more athletic, though. Like, what is it about the smart? And then my mind was blown. I was like, oh, my gosh, if the verb to raise a child has any meaning at all, it means that you incentivize your children as prisoners in your home to know all of the things that you think are important for children to know. And none of the things that you don't care about. And so you have these kids, right? And they are your perfect children or else they don't eat. 
I said, of course your children are the smartest children. It's tautological, it's designed like that. And if there is such a thing as culture, then the children of your co-ethnics are next smartest. Because they share your values, they share their parents share your values, share your norms, right? And have made them know the things that y'all have decided are important and nothing else. The smartest children look like your children. They look like you. And the ones, I, I know it's in bad taste to call eight-year-olds. <laughs> but the ones that don't look like you are not as smart. I'm going to make a really controversial statement. I don't care. As it turns out, you have no responsibility to love the neighbor kids as much as you love your kids. They'll be fine. It's a problem when every single teacher thinks exactly the same way as me and the entire public board evaluates and creates systems of evaluation measurement determining what children are worthy and what children aren't worthy. And they do it super benevolently and they all think exactly the same way as me. And every year we talk about how children that don't look like me, well, they're just not all that good, are they? And we call it a racial achievement gap and we invite their parents in to discuss what they're doing wrong. And here's the numbers to prove it. The problem isn't difference. It's lack of representation in public institutional leadership. And until my school board, my public library board, my culture and heritage board, my police services board looks like my neighborhood. Some of the neighborhoods, some of the neighbor kids every year are going to be are going to be, well, you know, in need of remediation. How can I help? And some of the neighbor kids are going to be doing it right. Education is the part where you recognize but it's a power dynamic. It's not about deficiency. That was the story. So that was going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just end by saying uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, let's continue the conversation. We're part of the community and we want to help the community, so don't be shy and come and see us if there's anything we can do. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming out. And I think it's the energy and the people, you, the people that makes the city go better and makes the public institution. So, it's really great to see so many of you come out and so many people online. So I'm uh, thank you all for coming. And yes, as I'm going to repeat what other people said, um, we are here. We want to be part of the, 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 the community and hopefully more of you will come also to speak to us. Good night, and we can stick around here for pe people who may want to have some questions or chat with us. <laughs> <laughs>